Welcome to Classical Chats. I'm Tiffany. Today we have composer Samuel Andreev. He was born in Canada. He then moved to Paris to study composition. Now he lives in Strasbourg. I listened to a few of his pieces, and I am very intrigued by his choice of instrumentation. Very unique. I highly recommend that you listen to our playlist of his compositions. He also recently composed a set of piano pieces. So we're going to talk about his process. And also end on a little bit of a philosophical question of what makes a piece of music great. Welcome to Classical Chats. The first thing I ask、uh, is, how did your journey with classical music started? Oh well, my parents had a large collection of LPs,、mm. and、uh, I guess that dates me somewhat. But no, but that is a lovely world to live in. I I also had some LPs, not a lot, but、um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so so my dad got into collecting LPs in the '70s and '80s, and、uh, by the time I was, I don't know, eight or nine years old, I don't think they were listening to them all that much anymore. But there was a large collection of them, and we had just a lot of classical LPs and things like that. And you know, I would just be sort of bored wandering through the house, <laughs> trying to figure out things to do、um, on my own, and、uh, just gravitated to the LP collection and started reading. The essays on the back of the records, and just reading about the works, and that got me intrigued. And then listening to them, and some things just really captured my attention. I just remember from from a very early age, I was just intrinsically、uh, drawn to the musical experience. Somehow, there are things like that that are very hard to explain. I think it's it's hard to put into words exactly why you would be viscerally drawn to music as an art. But that was the case with me, and everything I heard just. Made me more curious and want to go deeper and know more about about the composers and the works and and also be a musician myself. That's very interesting because、uh, it seems like you came to music from reading so much about the background. And、uh, I, I don't know how old were you when you were kind of browsing through the LPs. Oh, probably eight or nine years old. Yeah, that's、um, quite intelligent. I feel like a very intellectual way of approaching music because usually it's a very instinctive thing. And、um, I did not come to music from reading about music and really getting that history background. And from that point entering to music, I was just having fun pressing keys. So right,、um, right. Yeah, did music run in your background,、uh, in your family background then? Yeah, it did. My my parents are both amateur musicians, and I have、uh, two half sisters who are also,、uh, or who were at the time,、uh, studying flute and clarinet respectively.、Mm. So there was lots of music in the house, and also we had a we had an upright piano in the house in our living room that I was also completely drawn to. And I never actually took any、uh, formal piano lessons, but I was just fascinated by the piano,、mm. as a lot of children naturally are. You know, I've got a three year old daughter, and she just loves to go up to the piano and and, and press the keys and listen to it and interact with it as just kind of like a machine for making sounds. That's and, cute.、Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so I, I can I'm getting to relive that whole experience. But yeah, so so I was definitely drawn to. The piano and any any musical instrument, actually, for that matter. And I remember being, I can't remember if I was six or seven years old, but I asked my mother if I could take violin lessons. We I grew up in a really small town in Ontario, in Canada, and、uh, there wasn't a great deal of musical activity there. There certainly, you know, we had no orchestra or anything like that.、Uh, but I just remember asking her, "Can I can I take violin lessons?" And she let me do it. So we found a local violin teacher and. Um, and I started doing that, so that was the first instrument that I picked up.、Mm, how many more did you pick up since? Well, I played violin until we moved to Toronto, which was when I was eight years old, and at that point,、um, I switched to cello. I don't remember exactly why,、hmm. but I started taking cello lessons. And at the time in Ontario, there was really excellent public music education. So, if you wanted to, you could enter this sort of special musical program. Uh, that took place, I believe, during lunch hours and after school, and this sort of thing. And it was free, and anybody who wanted to participate could. So they would make sure you had an instrument, and you would get lessons,、uh, and then there would be collective、um, music making, you know, either you know the band or the orchestra or whatever it would be. And I can't emphasize enough how absolutely critical those sorts of experiences are for young、yeah. people. So that certainly made an impression on me, and I got to play the cello. Not only just take cello lessons, but also from a very early stage, learn how to play with other people, learn how to play in a in an orchestra or in an ensemble.、Mm. And I did that from when I was, I guess, about nine until 
gosh, I don't know, 15 or 16, something like that. And when I was 17, I switched to the oboe. So hmm. I had three instruments that I learned. <laughs> you had a lot of interests then switching around and really getting to know different uh, instruments. So from oboe, and then at some point, I guess you switched to composing or was it simultaneous? The, com- the composition was always there. That was always huh. present. Yeah, from, from when I was very, very young, I remember I would spontaneously invent music in my head or whistle it to myself or try to write it down. You know, one of my early cello teachers, I used to pester him at the end of our lessons and say, I've got this idea and I'd play it for him on the cello and ask him if he could help me notate it. And so he would give me uh, sheets of music paper and, and try to help me write them out and that kind of thing. So that's sort of how it began. Uh, but I was always involved in trying to invent music somehow or another with whatever means I had at the time. And in terms of actually studying composition, I didn't start to do that until I was 18. So up to that point, I was really self-taught and just trying to figure out really basic things. How do you, you know, how do you write music down, learning basic music theory, that kind of thing. Did you see yourself pursuing or becoming a musician around that age? I didn't have a clearly defined goal at that stage. I just knew that I was completely gripped by music and by musical experiences. The thing is, I was actually interested in quite a lot of different things. Uh, I, I suppose one of my basic attributes, and it can be as much a, 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 a it can be as much a, a problem as a quality, is that I'm excessively open-minded. So I was interested in lots of different things at the same time. Hmm. So I was interested also in the visual arts and uh, poetry and literature and all kinds of things. And there was a time during my adolescence where it wasn't really clear which of those things would be my main focus. Mm. So when I was a teenager living in Toronto, I was intensely involved in the world of poetry. And um, yeah, very, very closely involved with that. And also music at the same time. So, but at the same time, I mean, music was the thing that, that was the closest to me. And I think part of the reason for that is it was the thing that I found the most difficult. And it was the thing that seemed to resist me the most. And I can't help but be fascinated by things that are difficult or that resist me because it was like a, it's almost like a challenge, you know, Hmm. it's like, you, you want to, you want to understand this thing better. And with music, I just had the sense of something almost unfathomably profound that you could almost never quite get to the bottom of because there's just so much to it. There's so much depth there. There's so much richness in a, in a great work of music. Hmm. But then I guess you really wanted to fully pursue that uh, search for what it is that makes music so profound and really decide to pursue it professionally. Yeah, when I was 18 or 19, probably earlier than that, actually, it was pretty much set for me that that's what I wanted to do. And I set about thinking, you know, how I could actually achieve that. I was totally naive when I was 18. I mean, I had no concept of how the profession worked. I think or what the, many 18 year olds yeah. are also the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that's true. I mean, but I, I really had no idea what was involved in that, what the training was like or anything. Mm-hmm. And but I did have an idea that if I was going to do it the way I wanted to do it, first of all, I would need to be able to be in a supportive environment. I would need to be in a place that reflected my own interests at the time, let's say, uh, and find teachers also that were sympathetic to what I was interested in. And I felt then uh, that Toronto was probably not the ideal place for that. Mm. So pretty early on, uh, by the time I was 19 or 20, I was pretty much set on the idea of moving to Europe. So I eventually did that when I was 22 Mm. and eventually studied composition at the Paris Conservatory. Ah, so that must be quite a change. What was it like? Were there things that you didn't expect or um, exceeded your expectations? Well, it was simultaneously extremely exciting and unbelievably difficult because, you know, when you're young, especially when you haven't really confirmed yourself professionally, you're in a very vulnerable position because, you know, moving to a new place, particularly a a new culture, a new language, uh, trying to establish yourself. It's it's very, very difficult. But I think I was uh, carried forward by the excitement of the adventure and by the challenge and by the fact that, you know, I had a sense that if I could somehow succeed, at, you know, on my own terms at what I wanted to do, then that would be just a an, an extraordinary prize. That would be something really worth 
the uh, the trouble, the difficulty, the um, the uncertainty that was involved in pursuing it. Explain to me how you've clearly succeeded in finding your own voice and uh, making these really unique, actually, I, I have to say, I was listening to, before you recommended that you uh, wanted to talk about the piano pieces, I was listening to your other ensemble pieces, and I really thought it was very unique, the choice of instrumentation um, you chose. So uh, walk me through how, from Paris on, you've clearly found your own voice and succeeded. I mean, everyone has different opinions about what success looks like, but to me, it seems like you have uh, succeeded in becoming and finding your own voice. So, yeah. What was that like? Yeah, well, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, I have no idea how my career trajectory is perceived, so it's it's funny when you when you're in the inside of it. Of course, you you you're you're besieged with doubts. So that's just you know that's par for the course. I think every musician has has that experience. But um, well, what I can say is the 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 Paris experience was interesting because I mean, I, so the school that I went to is a bit unusual in the sense that it's it's the, the music training that happens in France is highly hierarchical in nature. It's like a pyramid. So you have you have municipal conservatories, then you have regional and departmental conservatories, and then you have two national conservatories, and they're sort of at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. So there's one in Paris and there's one in Lyon. And it's, it's relatively unique, I think, uh, in, in terms of the way that musical education is structured there. So the idea is, you, you know, you start at your local level, and if you are ambitious and talented, then you keep working up until you get to a national conservatory. So, so the result of that is that it's extraordinarily difficult to get into one of those two national schools, and they have very few spots available for composers. So once you're there, though, the difference is that the likelihood that you will remain a professional composer is extremely high because most of the people who get into that program already have some measure of professional success. They've already been through a very, very difficult process of doing auditions and uh, and getting their work performed and so on. So they're already sort of at a semi-professional level, if not a, prof a fully professional level by the time they start that program in many cases. So so the, the program itself is in, it was it was unusual in the sense that we were all sort of burgeoning professionals at the same time as pursuing our our education and by the time we graduated most of us had you know a foot in the door as far as commissions would go and and that sort of thing uh, and it's also a program that you start relatively late uh, i know in the us it's common to start studying composition at an undergraduate level so you might be 18 or 19 and then you work your way up and maybe eventually you do a doctorate or something like that this was a little bit different. I think the average age of people starting that program was probably 25 or 26, something like that. Mm. I myself was 25. So uh, so by the time I finished, I, I wasn't a beginner. I wasn't just sort of starting out my, my musical journey. Um, the years immediately after that were difficult, as it often is, when you're making the transition from being a student to being a fully-fledged professional. But the way that I tried to get through that uh, and if, if there's one, I don't typically like to give advice, but if there's one bit of advice I could give to younger musicians, uh, it is that one thing that always helped me, and I think that really made the difference between, um, you know, have, having the ability to keep doing this and stalling, uh, is that I tried to always focus on contribution, having uh, adopting a contribution mentality rather than an extraction mentality. And what what I mean by that is, how can you do projects that are beneficial not only to you, but also to the people you're working with? And what can you contribute? How can you make the world of music a little bit better, a little bit more interesting? What can you do to contribute? And I think when you practice contributing rather than extracting, you know, thinking, what can I get out of this system? Then it's inevitable that that, that creates a certain energy. You know, people are going to want to uh, be involved in that. So that's always been my experience. So that, that's what I tried to do, even when I had absolutely no opportunities coming my way, when things were really, really tight, things were really difficult. I still tried to think, well, what can I do to add something or to make things a little bit better? So that was what I did for uh, a few years. And eventually, you know, it started to it started to work. So, well, work, let's say. Eventually, I, I started to have more autonomy and more more opportunities come my way. A lot of people are always like, okay, what is the point? What am I mm -hmm. getting out of this, uh, spending this many hours trying to 
play this piece or maybe try to pursue a music career like what am I getting out of it if I'm not succeeding or I'm not wherever they think that they should be so I think that's a really um, wise way of looking at how to pursue it despite all the ups and downs and the difficult times before you can really feel autonomous yeah, I, I think there's an idea. Well, it's slightly different for composers than it is for performers because performers are almost by definition contributing something because it, you're up there doing incredibly difficult things and uh, and and communicating directly with the audience. And with composers, it's it is slightly different. I think it's not it's maybe not as obvious uh, what what contribution might entail. I, I don't think it's really? necessarily enough. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's necessarily enough simply to write the pieces. Huh. I don't think that's that's quite enough, uh, because for composers, you you not only have to create the pieces, but you also have to create the conditions for the pieces to be heard, and to be uh, understood and appreciated and and enjoyed. Uh, and I think that's going to be increasingly the case as composers move away from a kind of institutional support type of setting, which has been the the main model in Europe since you know. Well, in Germany since World War II, and and in France since the nineteen seventies, and the idea that there will be heavy um, uh, uh, public subsidies for composers that will allow you to do your work and so on, and, and uh, well-funded institutions such as the German radio orchestras or uh, IRCAM in Paris and things like this, I don't think we should take it for granted that these sorts of institutions will exist forever, uh, and that we'll be able to just sort of tap into the audiences that are sort of tailor-made to those sorts of places. I think that it's going to be increasingly the case that composers have to create their own audience mm. and uh, and and in many cases from scratch. So I think that's part of it. And getting it out there and creating a community around what you're doing, I think is actually part of the the, the job of being a composer. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah. you might want to think in terms of, well, what, what would my community consist of? Uh, how large does that community need to be in order for this activity of mine to be viable? And what can I contribute to it? How can I make the lives of the people that are immediately surrounding me a little bit better, more interesting, whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how you started your activities on YouTube? Well, what that came out of actually was I was an analysis professor in a conservatory in northern France uh, in a small town called Cambrai. And I was teaching both classical analysis and also contemporary works. I would alternate them. So we would do a, you know, a piece by Beethoven one week, and then the next week we'd look at a piece by Berio or Stockhausen or something. And I put a lot of care into those courses, and I was really passionate about, about, about the teaching. But I had a relatively small class. I may have had you know maybe 10 students or something. And it just occurred to me at one point that I was putting in many cases, you know, hours and hours and hours of preparation time into these classes, which would then benefit, you know, a handful of students. So I thought, well, this is, you know, this is fine. I'm happy to do that. But there might be a way to maximize the impact of all of the careful analysis and research I'm doing. So I just decided, well, why don't, why don't I just film myself as though I were presenting a course in a classroom and put it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that was, uh, this was probably in 2014 or 2015, I started noticing that a lot of university professors and uh, other types and just, um, yeah, uh, uh, people involved in the arts were starting to put a lot of really sophisticated and um, uh, really detailed lectures about pretty much anything you could imagine on YouTube. You know, YouTube was no longer simply a platform to watch some funny cat videos and things like that, but it was something where you could actually get an education and a, a, a free education also, and that this was accessible to everybody. So that that kind of got my attention. And then I realized that virtually nobody seemed to be doing that for composition. So I just thought, well, why not start offering my course materials online? And at first I did it in the crudest way imaginable. Like I, I had no technique, no equipment, had no idea how to do it. I would just film myself in one take, no editing, nothing, and just put it up on YouTube. And I thought, well, you know, if if 50 people watch this, and 50 is more than 15, so that's already an increase in the number of people who are going to get to see these lectures. But it very quickly grew, much to my surprise. I did almost nothing to promote the videos. I just put them on my YouTube channel, and I guess through Facebook and social media and other people 
promoting them. And uh, I got the attention of a few high profile people early on and they started to share them. And then it just, it just grew from there. And soon I was getting thousands and thousands of views. So, um, so that was a real eye opener. And it, it showed me also that there's a tremendous demand for this kind of knowledge. Yeah. And all over the, it's all over the world. I mean, people in 160 countries are watching my videos, and it's it's just completely crazy to me. The internet is uh, quite surreal in that sense that it can really exponentially expand your your uh, audience. And well, also, it's not really a surprise that your videos um, had such high views because there I saw a couple of them um, before I reached out to you, and I thought. They're very well explained and very easy to follow and also very educational. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so from 2014, 2015, we're getting there, getting closer to the <laughs> piano pieces. Uh, anything else in between that um, would be interesting to share before we jump five years ahead? Well, you mentioned the ensemble pieces and the unusual instrumentation. And I think that's something that's been a feature of my music since pretty early on. One of the things I'd say about that is I was really fascinated by woodwind instruments, which is, I suppose, a natural thing being an oboist. But I was particularly interested in all of these sort of slightly marginal or esoteric instruments that uh, that got invented, but not particularly, that never became you know standard members of the orchestra or things like that, or that be, never quite caught on exactly. Mm -hmm. I started realizing that there are all these instruments that have, you know, in, in some cases, really, really interesting sounds and, and just really interesting characters that for one reason or another were were quite rare or that just weren't often being written for. And it struck me as being a potential source of, uh, of, of not only of material, but a, a way of sort of uh, coming up with new types of textures and, and enriching the, the sort of sonic landscape of my work by you know, always looking for not just standard combinations of instruments, but things that might be a little bit more unusual or exotic and uh, and trying to go as far as I could in that direction. So that, that's that been uh, a fairly prominent part of my work, I would say, from the beginning. Yeah, so I was actually very surprised to hear your newer compositions, the piano pieces, because um, to me, it, I, well, I don't really come from a piano contemporary piano background, I am very classical, very, very classical. So uh, I am naturally more intrigued by just non-piano repertoire. And mm -hmm. kind of here, it, it's just, because I'm always used to the piano sound in a way. So uh, I'm just more fascinated by the other instrumentations. But um, yeah, walk me through how your inspiration came to be to go from more exotic and unusual instrumentation to just kind of if I may call the piano basic, uh, kind of the fundamental instrument, and so well, I don't mean it in a <laughs> in a uh, complimentary way, but just piano is kind of the basis of so many uh, composers' journey. I feel like um, it's a pretty standard tool. Um, so yeah, how did you go all the way back to the piano? Well, part of it had to do with trying to put down on paper my own conception of the instrument. And the, the compositions that I've written for piano are a way of, I think, uh, trying to distill the particular way that I approach the piano and what I think of it as an instrument. And for me, what the piano is, is fundamentally a contrapuntal instrument. And that's always been the sort of repertoire that I've gravitated to the most. Now, obviously, I'm aware that there's all kinds of repertoire that, that isn't primarily contrapuntal in terms of its textures. Uh, for example, the entire second half of the 19th century is a repertoire that uh, has never particularly resonated with me. Uh, what I was really interested in was early keyboard music, the things like the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, so the English Virginalist uh, composers like Orlando Gibbons, William Byrd, John Bull, uh, also um, Baroque composers such as Rameau. I was fascinated also by the keyboard works of Bach but also Frescobaldi and Couperin and all kinds of early Italian Baroque masters. And that was the sort of music that I think interested me the most, partly because its, its emphasis is on horizontal, the horizontal dimension, the melodic dimension in music. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a very clear idea of separate voices and contrapuntal textures. And each voice has 
an, an equal importance in determining the overall texture. Whereas when you get into the classical period and beyond, that that idea of a of a balance between the voices and an, and a, a sort of uh, yeah an, an equalness, if I can put it that way, of of every sound event as being really very important in the piece, uh, starts to shift towards other things. So in in a, a piano sonata by Mozart, for example. If you have something like an Alberti bass with a melody on top of it, there's a clear hierarchy there in terms of what is going to grab your attention the most. The Alberti bass will sink into the background of your perception. It's like a, a pattern that once it's been established and you have an idea of what it sounds like, you no longer have to actively listen to it in a certain sense. You know, you're going to be focusing your attention more on the melody. So it's not as uh, it, it's not it's not the same sort of texture. So obviously, different repertoires have different priorities and, and different things that they are attempting to do. But what always grabbed me the most certainly was uh, was early keyboard music, harpsichord music, and uh, and things like that. So in my own piano pieces, I'm fundamentally I'm, I'm involved in that kind of a texture, but with a harmonic and gestural and rhythmic language that is completely different. So the challenge was to figure out how I can integrate those things, how I could write the sort of music that I want to write uh, while still keeping to that kind of very, very lean, sort of transparent texture. Can you briefly explain what contrapuntal means? Just because some of us might, or well, some of the listeners might not know what that means. Oh, counterpoint just just has to do with how you would have uh, multiple different voices in a composition that are going on simultaneously, and how do you how do you organize them? So uh, as opposed to harmonic, so har harmony has to do with simultaneous sounds. So sounds that are all happening at the same time. So a chord will be four different notes, for example, played at the same time. And in a chord, you're not necessarily paying attention to each individual note. So you're hearing it as a single sound. Uh, whereas in, in a contrapuntal texture, you're aware that there are different independent voices that are pursuing their own different trajectories. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have to line up in such a way that makes sense harmonically. So in fact, the, the terms harmony and counterpoint are, are it, it's artificial, really, to make a, a strict separation between those two things. Mm. But counterpoint has to do with the vertical or the melodic dimension in a piece of music, and harmony has more to do, sorry, the horizontal, horizontal and, right, and, and, right, and melodic dimension, and harmony has more to do with the vertical uh, dimension of notes sounding at the same time. Come to think of it, actually, and now now I understand, um, because to me, it uh, I listen to a few of your piano pieces, and it's um, you're right, it's very... Uh, horizontal it's not so much of a chord progression by any means to me um something though i will ask perhaps from more of a devil's advocate but also just a, a general station that i always get from listening to contemporary and more um, current piano compositions is uh, you mentioned gestural uh, as a word you mentioned but also i always find that they are very fragmentary Correct me if uh, that is completely not your uh, intention or your style of composing, but do you have any thoughts or comments on that? To me, it's uh, maybe it's just because I come from fairy classical, so it's you hear a longer melody, maybe it's a eight bar phrase, and then there's some development uh, going on that's related to that. So it's kind of a more continued narrative. Whereas when I play or listen to more contemporary piano pieces that's a lot of subito dynamics and uh not very continuous of a narrative it's a kind of i think of it maybe more like a reflection of modern society where you have so many things going on and many stimulations and uh it, perhaps it's a reflection of that but i'm not so sure so i wanted to ask well, first of all, I would, I would question the idea that this is characteristic of contemporary piano music as a whole, because there are certainly lots of composers uh, whose work isn't like that. So if people like Philip Glass, for example, write music that is very continuous and very linear and has a, a very clear uh, uh, harmonic trajectory for the most part. Then you have people like Arvo Parrott, for example, who are writing very melodic things that, that are uh, quite also quite linear in nature. I think there's there's really a very wide spectrum of different approaches to right, yeah, of writing for the keyboard. One thing I would say, though, is that, at least in my experience, in terms of the, uh, the composers of my own generation that I've interacted with, very few of them are writing for piano. Hmm. And Why is yeah, I mean, 
Well, I think I think it's partly because the piano is an instrument that is perceived to have a very weighty sort of historical baggage surrounding it. <laughs> and I think that's for younger composers that can be extremely daunting to figure out, well, how can I write for piano in a way that brings anything new or anything personal to it, given that you have a repertoire of, you know, untold thousands of masterpieces that already exist? Why do we need any more? What can I possibly contribute to that repertoire? That sort of thing. So, and I can recognize that that's, that's a genuine difficulty. Whereas I think if you're writing a piece for solo percussion or, you know, whatever it might be, then those sorts of connotations are there, but they're not, they're not quite as heavy as they can be, uh, certainly with respect to the piano. So as far as the musical language being fragmented, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm willing to accept that that's the case, but it's not something that I ever consciously set out to do. I think what it is, is I, I try to go with the, well, I try to go with what the, what the material is telling me, what the material is trying to do in the piece. So that's one thing. Well, can I add one thing? And by fragmentary, I don't mean it in a negative sense, but take, I don't know, uh, Frehley's, for example. Anyone can hum that and sing that, right? Whereas, uh, is it possible for someone to to sing, uh, could be one of yours, but it could be a, a kind of the style of uh, composition that I'm referring to. Could someone really sing that? So that's what I mean by fragmentary, not necessarily that it's a, I mean, I realize it's an overgeneralization, but also just a little background. The few piano pieces that I have uh, been exposed to, they were part of competition repertoire requirements. So of course, mm -hmm. in those scenarios, they're trying to uh, challenge your way of playing and to get all the possible uh, technical virtuosity possible within a 10 minute piece. So uh, I realize I'm very limited in my exposure to that contemporary piano repertoire in general, but um, yeah, that's what I meant by fragmentary, not maybe not necessarily right. even composition style, because it depends on how mm -hmm. long your attention span is and your uh, focus is. But that's what I mean by fragmentary. Yeah, I, I would say there are certainly pieces of mine that are explicitly melodic in nature and that do have melodies that you could potentially hum. The piano pieces probably aren't conspicuously like that, although I think even there, there are nevertheless linear things that, that you could at least potentially whistle. I don't know if anyone would actually do that. Uh, but when I look at 20th century piano repertoire, for example, or, or 19th century piano repertoire, there's a lot of things where I think it would be ex extraordinarily challenging to to whistle them. Like yeah. if, you, if you think of things like Scarbo, for example, by by Ravel, you know, or uh, or some of the etudes of Chopin, for example, or all kinds of things like that, where where there's a, a very high degree of virtuosity and there's very complex textures and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it would also be it would be extremely challenging. That actually reminds me, though, of uh, you mentioned 20th century. There was that movement of art for art's sake. So mm. perhaps that still is permeating the style of composition in a way that you know, it's not meant to be sung or it's not meant for a use or a certain purpose external to the music itself. So uh, maybe it's part of that. I don't know. Well, I've never really understood what's meant by art for art's sake because I don't think, I don't think anybody would invest themselves in the manner that is necessary to be a composer if there was absolutely no intention for you know what they wanted it to do in the world or what they wanted it to be for, uh, if it was just simply an activity pursued for its own sake. I mean, an activity pursued for its own sake for me is a is essentially a hobby. You know, it's like if you if you if you collect. Um, I don't know, postage stamps or something. That, that's an activity that you pursue for, for its own sake. But I don't think anyone would devote their entire life to art if, if it were just merely a kind of circular activity with no particular uh, intention behind it. Hmm. Wouldn't I mean, there the are... Hobby? Sorry, uh, I'm, I also come from a, a philosophical study. I, I actually studied philosophy and not music when I went to uh, undergraduate. So pardon my, my sudden uh, interruptions, but I'm Please. fascinated just because uh, you mentioned hobby, collecting stamps. Is it for its own sake or is it just for yourself? Well, I think I think the, the question ultimately is what what expectations do you have surrounding the activity? What what do you expect to come of it? Right, which so, leads so, me to asking you, what do you see your composition as doing? You know, clearly uh, you don't think that it's just for the notes or for the music itself or for 
art for art's sake. So what does that mean in terms of uh, for your own composition and your pursuit? Oh, it's a great question. So there's, there's, a, there's a few things that are sort of nested inside of each other. So one on, on the most basic level, the most obvious thing I can say is that composition has given me a life. You know, it's given me a sense of purpose. It's given me something to reach for. It's given me something to strive for. And it's given me something, you know, that I can, I can devote myself to fully that constantly forces me to stretch myself to the very limits of my abilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that on any level, regardless of what you do, uh, in your life. I think it's it's extraordinarily valuable to engage in a pursuit of that kind. You know, whether you're an artist or a plumber or whatever it might be, you know, it's it's extraordinarily useful to to frame things in those terms. So if you if you have a life in that sense, if you have something uh, exalted that you're that you're aiming towards, then that will have positive repercussions for, not only for you, but also for the people in your circle, also for the people in your family. Mm -hmm. Uh, and potentially also for your community, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so that in, in that sense, I think it's it's incredibly valuable to try to pursue something like that and to do it in a way that is uh, as as devoted as possible. Well, it definitely shows from even your way of explaining your process and your compositions. So, um, commend you for that. I wanted to end on one last thing, which is. Uh, I read on your website that you're obsessed with explaining what makes a piece of music worth listening to or what makes it great. So if you can put that in a nutshell, I know people have written thousands of articles, essays, books on, you know, what is great music, why music, what is music. So anything you want to end on to kind of encapsulate um, your approach to music or maybe your composition? Well, I often think of Bach uh, when this question comes up, because one of the things that really strikes me in terms of Bach is how many different dimensions his music touches upon. So it has a aesthetic function, obviously. It has a dance function. You know, he wrote some incredibly exciting rhythmic music. There's also a theological slash religious function in his music that's very clear. There is a scientific aspect to it, a technical aspect through his pursuits of, you know, finding the, the limits of counterpoint, finding the limits of what you can do uh, uh, chromatically on a keyboard, things like that. Uh, and there's also a pedagogical dimension through things like the two and three part inventions, uh, through all of his attempts at writing pieces that could, uh, that could serve as a kind of instruction, not only for young uh, keyboardists, but also for uh, composers or, or just anybody wanting to know more about music. So what I think is fascinating is, is you have something that encapsulates an entire worldview. Like it, it imagines that the person engaging with the music is, a, is somebody who wants their complete being to be affected by the music uh, on every dimension. And I think that's a really worthwhile goal for composers to have. In other words, the, you know, a great piece of music is something that is really multidimensional. It, it encapsulates a worldview. It, it, it encapsulates, whether intentionally or unintentionally, an entire system of values. What do you think is important? What, is, what sits you know, upon your personal hierarchy? Uh, why are those things important? And then if, in addition to that, obviously, there's the whole technical aspect of how the piece is actually put together. But when I'm analyzing a piece or when I'm presenting a piece publicly, I always try to get to the heart of what is the composer trying to do with the piece? What does the piece mean? Uh, what does it do in the world? Uh, what is unique about the piece also that maybe uh, another piece or another composer would not have done? And then you start looking at the how of it. In other words, what particular choice does, did the composer make in attempting to bring all of these things about? And the, the technical aspects and the, and the tools that a composer will bring to bear upon a particular musical project are always chosen uh, uh, with regards to the thing that they're trying to say. You don't start by saying, oh, I'm going to write a piece using this or that technique, and then we'll just see what happens out of it. Or at least I don't. Uh, I, I, would, I would start by having uh, an idea of what I think is important, what I want to, to say, and then finding the appropriate techniques and tools and so on that I need to, to say what, whatever it is. Hmm. That actually <laughs> brought another question to my mind. So I apologize for my lie about that being the last question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you said uh, you want to know what does that piece mean when you look at a piece of music? 
So since I would love for our, our listeners to also listen to your compositions and your piano pieces that you wanted to recommend and talk about uh, for our chat, what I mean, there are many piano pieces within that suite. So what did they mean? If someone were to analyze your music, what should they understand from it? Just because you had um, said that's kind of how you look at music, you kind of ask this question, what does it mean? So what does your piano piece mean? Yeah, see, this is where I start to seem a bit two-faced because I'm happy to do it for other people, but it's much harder to do it uh, for my own work. And what I would probably say, and I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out, but I would I would probably refrain from uh, from describing what the pieces mean because, I, I mean, I know what they mean to me and I know what they mean to a lot of people who listen to them, but I, I honestly think it's it's better with respect to my own work to let the listeners sort that out for themselves. And if they're intrigued by them enough to listen to them again, then they can. Yeah, it sounds completely. It's uh, so interesting because yeah. imagine if you were analyzing a Chopin piece, and that is what Chopin is saying to you while you're trying to analyze and ask the question, what it means. It's a very interesting um, paradox, if I can call it. Um, yeah, but. Well, there are there are composers that are really concerned with explaining what they've done to the public. You know, there's okay. a few. A few examples come to like Stockhausen was obsessed with that. He was always giving these lectures, these lengthy lectures, explaining in tremendous technical detail exactly what he was trying to do in this or that piece. I'm not particularly interested in doing that. I, to some, when it comes to my own work, maybe it's because there are certain things in the work that are so personal or almost secret, I suppose, that it it would be ex- extremely difficult to imagine trying to trying to explain them. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what I do is really intuitive. Uh, it probably doesn't come across that way, but it's but on 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 one level, if you if you get down to the bottom of what I'm trying to do, a lot of it is intuitive and, and actually hard to put into words. So that's probably part of it. And and frankly, it's just better when somebody else does it, when somebody other than the composer, I think, looks at it from a certain distance and then can put it into a, a context in a way that I personally can't because I'm too close to it. So that's also part of the reason why, you know, I probably wouldn't want to do that myself. That's a that's a very interesting point to end on, I think. Also, by the way, congratulations on your recent world premieres. You were mentioning how uh, having that distance and hearing other people uh, interpret and analyze your music, that reminded me of your recent premieres. So I wanted to say oh, congrats, congratulations. Thank you so much. That was a good feeling to have a, a concert with a live audience. Yeah, I was uh, also want to mention or ask whether the pandemic has influenced your composition. I guess, okay, this will be the last question. And we'll end it there, I swear. <laughs> I'm starting not to believe you. Um, yes, well, the pandemic actually in- affected my composition surprisingly little. And part of the reason for that is just because of the way my life is set up. I mean, most of the time I'm working and teaching at home. Mm. And the-, the main thing that it affected, of course, was traveling, because I normally do travel quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And I live in Strasbourg, which is very centrally located within Europe. I'm very close to Switzerland and very close to Germany and all sorts of other places. So it's normal for me to to travel internationally. And so suddenly not to be able to do that was was a big change. But in terms of the work itself, it didn't actually affect me all that much because as a composer, and I, obviously I recognize it's very different for performers, but for me, my projects are usually defined several years in advance. So, you know, if I if I have to write a big piece, then probably the contract is signed and and the terms are agreed upon, you know, a minimum of two or three years hmm. before the premiere will actually happen. So in that case, you know, having an interruption of four months or six months or or even a year didn't actually really disrupt things all that much because I still had, you know, a, a long list of long-term projects to work upon. Hmm. So that's what that's what I've been doing for the past year. I've obviously been going out a little bit less. I've I've been traveling less and uh, it was also very disruptive not to have daycare because I have a young daughter. So I had to learn how to work with, uh, with, you know, with my family around all the time, uh, which was also actually really nice, but it meant finding new ways to work. So, but the work itself, I don't think really changed all that much. You know, it's, it's, I have a, I have a daily routine with composition. I write every day. I've been doing that for over 20 years and the pandemic hasn't changed that. Hmm. I'm glad to hear that um, it hasn't negatively impacted too much of your work and your career. So, well, I I promised that was going to be my last question. So thank you so much for your time. I know you're very busy. So thank you so much.
It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I definitely learned a bit more about what it's like to be a composer, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out our other episodes of Classical Chats, whether on our YouTube or on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Thank you very much. Till next time.